So as we're coming in, uh, bad guy or suspects start shooting. For, he's on the left side, start shooting. I'm thinking, holy shit, those are for us. Pop, 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 pop. So it was like hitting concrete behind us. Like when you get sand in your shoe, yeah, concrete's yeah. going down. Well, luckily, there's two officers that or kudos to them. They actually came, broke this big mirror that Pulse had, broke that mirror, and they came inside and, and then turned and returned fire towards him. I'm sorry, let me say his name, Omar Mateen, because that helps me every time I say it. So they returned fire towards Omar Mateen. So now I go through the S hallway, and I remember looking up, and I just see straight carnage. Hey guys, if you missed out on the last conference in Nashville, Tennessee, you don't want to miss out on the next one. It's April 28th through May 3rd, Orlando, Florida, the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center. You made a mistake missing the last one. You don't want that to happen again on this one. Five days of some of the best training you're ever going to experience packed into one event. We have an early bird special right now, $50 off. Use 24 early bird on our website, streetcop.com. Look for the conference, click the link, register today. If you want to get significantly better at this profession in five days, don't dare miss out on the 2024 Street Cop Conference. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino, and we are on part two with Rick Fink. And the first time we spoke with him, we went to topics that were kind of unrelated to the original reason why we're going to do the podcast, but it was good stuff. I didn't want to take that away from anybody, but today we're going to talk about something that we were supposed to talk about originally, which was the Pulse nightclub shooting, his response, and the impact it had in his life thereafter. So, Rick, I appreciate you coming back on the podcast, brother. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Much more at ease this time, so I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I'm just a regular dude. So, yeah, the first time I was a little bit nervous, but now I just realized, yeah, regular dude, let's just have a, a good chat. When we were at the conference, a lot of guys and girls were, you know, excited to meet us, and I appreciate it tremendously. But I told everybody, I'm like, guys, I'm no different than everybody else. Like, this Saturday, I'm going to be in my backyard cleaning up dog shit like everybody else, <laughs> right? Putting into a bag, like, then I'm going to bring my kids to baseball, and like jujitsu and then i'm gonna like do dad shit and go to dinner and like that's how life is for me outside and this is just my job this is what i do for a living oh i just i just cleaned up dog shit in the backyard so yeah it's same thing yeah with that being said let's go into it let's talk about what happened that night and maybe can clue some people in what like what it was like to respond to something like that yeah so you know the biggest thing is how many victims died at the pulse night club and everyone knows 49 victims died so when I talk about it, I do my presentations, I say there was actually 50 victims. And a lot of people think when I say 50, I'm including the suspect. I'm actually not. I'm including uh, Christina Grimmie. She was on the show, The Voice on NBC. And she, Adam Levine was her coach and she made it to the finals. So the night before Pulse, um, she was giving a concert at one of the local venues in Orlando. There was a concert and there was a shooting at the concert. So I got dispatched to the hospital. When I get to the hospital, they say, hey, go to trauma bay five. There's only in that trauma bay, there's only five beds. So, of course, that night she's in the last bed on the right side of the bed. There's a bunch of boxes and stuff. So she's laying on the bed on her back, looking towards where I have to sit. So a lieutenant comes in and says, no one's allowed in here. I'm like, you know, who is this? This seems like a bigger thing than a normal shooting. So I Google who she is. Cause the nurse said she was a singer. I Google her and I see a Twitter video from her that says, Hey guys, I'll, be in Orlando tonight at the Plaza Live. I look at the timestamp. It was only about four hours before that. So I realized, wow, this is a singer. So I'm sitting there because of the big call it is. I We do two-hour rotations. I don't get my relief. So after two hours, I'm like, I have seen dead bodies before, but something something was off. And I just said, hey, hey dang, sorry that happened to you tonight. Where are you from? And I spent the next two hours talking to her. Right? I didn't understand all that. So that night, or that morning, I went home. My wife asked me, you know, what was it? I was like, oh, I wasn't really involved. You know, as a man, you can't tell her. So the next night is Pulse. And why I say she's the 50th victim, because she gets forgotten about, right? This is a singer that was on The Voice. And because of Pulse was the next night, we forgot about her. That's why I say 50. 
So if I back it up to the Tuesday before the shooting, uh, I was working off. Let me just stop you real quick right there. Like, I'm sorry if I sound rude when I say this, but can you just elaborate? Did she, did she pass away? Yeah. So what it was is after the concert, um, she was standing there meeting and greeting the the guests. Uh, The suspect stood in line, like one, two, one, two, gets up to her. She goes to hug him. He was one of those guys that was obsessed with her. He came from down south, took a cab for two hours, came up there. That was his only plan. Shoots her point blank in the chest. The, her brother gets involved, but he's able to pull another gun out and he puts it to her head and pulls the trigger. This is the, she a young girl? Yes. Yeah, how old was she? Uh, I don't know her exact age, but I know she was early 20s. Okay, so yeah, yeah. It was just weird. I just, I don't know why I started talking to her. I just felt something, right? What about... What about the guy who shot her? What happened to him? He committed suicide. Crazy. So he came, he got a hotel room. They searched his hotel room. There was nothing there. It was just like a clean room. So he clearly all he brought was what he had on him and two, the two firearms down his house or apartment in South Florida. Obviously, he had pictures of her and everything like that. He was obsessed with her. I had heard he even got hair extensions to try to impress her. When you go back and you Google the photos, He's in like a Texas burnt orange shirt. He sits on the last row on the aisle. So you, it's like, where's Waldo? You see him in every photo. And it's just crazy how that was his whole plan, you know, just to do that. I mean, let me back that up. You get to the hospital and she's passed already. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Did she die on scene? Yes. Um, and it was, he put it a little above her temple. So her eyes actually stayed open. So it was like, I could actually see that her last face. So it was kind of I, fucking terrible, dude. It is, and I can't explain. I've, like I said, I've seen dead bodies, unfortunately, before, but after two hours of just, I say quiet, even though the, tr- the hospital is, you know, making all the noises, but it was just two hours, and I just, I don't know, I started talking to her, you know? So you had to experience that the day before the Pulse shooting. Right, and I say the day before, you know, people want to critique me, so June 10th is when the shooting was, right? So the next morning, obviously, June 11th, I'm at work, it turned to midnight, which turns June 12th. So that's why I always say the night before, but, you know, some critics want to say, you know, she didn't die the night before, but, you know, that's how it obviously was. Man, so you go home, you tell your wife. Yeah, it's nothing, you know, can't tell her. Was that a mistake not to say anything? Of course. Of course. Why? I wanted it to, you know, I didn't want my wife to think, oh, yeah, he just responded, you know, because me doing that is kind of why I call her the 50th victim because it's what happened. Everyone feels, like, oh yeah, that's what happened. You know, she's someone, she's just, she's someone's daughter, sister, had a whole life to live meeting and greeting. Like, and you watch the Twitter video. She's so nice in the Twitter video. It's just like, wow. You know, hmm. did you, when did you start learning more about her while you were sitting there next to her? No, I Googled that Twitter video, and that's really all I wanted to see. And then uh, the next morning, obviously, I worked midnight. So when I woke up, doing my thing around the house, and then while I'm eating breakfast, you know, I kind of just start Googling who she was and start watching the YouTube videos of her when she was on The Voice. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot about triggers. And it's crazy. One of my triggers is the song Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. She actually sings that song on The Voice. And... I'm an overthinker or a deep thinker. People say, if you listen to those lyrics, I came in like a wrecking ball. I hit so hard, I fall. But what does a wrecking ball do? It swings away, right? So here's her life on The Voice. She gets to the finals. People start knowing her. She's doing well. And she swings away because of some crazy guy. You know, it's sad to think about it like that. But It's horrible. Yeah, it's a horrible can, thing. Yeah, that song is a song that I can, I cannot listen to. So, Was there a lot of media coverage that night when she was uh, suddenly was. killed? There was, it was, he was on, even on the E channel, you know, because of who she was on the boys and Adam Levine and this and that. So it, there was, and then of course it all went away. Okay. So. so you go back to work, you're already feeling the burden of previous night. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was weird. I was, for some reason I listened to the wrecking ball song, her audition over and over on my way into work. Just, I don't know. I can't explain it, but yeah. Well, you're a human being, right? So you're connecting with that in some sense. It was just uh, weird. I just felt something after two hours, like, you know, and I talked for two hours and obviously, you know, she didn't respond, but we had a whole conversation, you know, and I just, what was in my mind is it was so weird that I was doing that, you know, but I mean, so yeah, I went to work and, uh, 
like I said, that Tuesday, bef- that was a Friday, obviously, the Tuesday before that, um, I worked off duty or extra duty. I don't know if you like, you know, where clubs pay an officer. So I was working off duty and, you know, I just want to put in my dip and just work my four hours and make my money and go home like every cop. And, you know, this security guard, she comes up to me and says, oh, what does it take to be a cop? And I was a rude dick. And I said, not talking to me right now. You know, I just, ru- yeah, I was just rude, you know. Had a long day on shift. Now I'm here working the extra hours, but kudos to her. She kept talking. And so we ended up talking for four hours and kudos to her, you know? So now here we are the night. Why do you think you responded that way? I'm just curious. It was just a long day at work. I'm tired. I went home, ate, got back, went back to work, just tired. And, you know, you get oftentimes working the clubs, you get people walk up. Oh, what does it take to be a cop? They don't really care. They're just drunk and want to have a conversation. Now, granted, she's different. She's the security guard. But yeah, I I was rude. One thousand percent, I was rude. You regret so, that at all? One thousand percent. But like I say, kudos to her because she kept talking. And yeah, why, why? What do you say to somebody who? I mean, I it's not uncommon to see a police officer act rude towards somebody. So, yeah, I think it. I think it's just the environment you're put in. You're at a club. It happens all the time. So you're biased. You think everyone that comes up to you is a drunk idiot, and it's just you know you just want to stand there and do your make your money and go home. You know? Okay, but like I said, kudos to her because you'll hear why she uh, is important to me. So the night of the shooting, um, the officer that's working off duty there is a friend of mine. So I'm in patrol or on patrol at the time I'm on shift, and he calls out for a fight at Pulse. Right, so I go there to back him up. He says, "Yeah, I think they went down the street where this park is. Can you go check the park? I go check the park. I come back up." If you ever watched the videos, there's a Crown Vic in the tinting place right next to Pulse. That's mine. So uh, we're standing there just having a quick conversation. And that security guard, like I said, kudos to her. She came out and said, oh, hey, Fink. This time I was nicer. Oh, hey. I said her name. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, do you mind just giving us a second? I wanted to be nice. And she said, yeah, no problem. And she gave me a hug and said, good to see you. I'll be inside. Awesome. Uh, then I got my car. I started driving down the street and then here, pop, 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 pop. So normally officer like shootings or officer involved shootings are typically over, you know, unless it's like an active shooter and I haven't experienced one, obviously. So I can hear it out my car window. I hear it on the radio. The officer is calling for, you know, shots fired. Um, when I get there, I think I was third on scene. Um, the off duty officer standing out in the middle of the street. You know what Oodaloop is? Yes. So he, for those of us, it's like a CD who skips, right? So it's our mind. So he's in the Oodaloop. He's in the middle of the street. Uh, Impala pulls up. We're behind the Impala. He punches out, fires a few rounds, comes in, looks at us, yells. I don't know what he, to this day, he doesn't even know what he yelled. Punches out, fires two more rounds, I believe. He comes over to where our little team is. He says, hey, uh, we're going to make entry. Now, there was an officer at the front of the Impala. The officer had their AR-15. He said, hey, you're going to be first. That officer went, like, we're all scared. And the off-duty officer said, do you want me to take your fucking gun? And as military and police officers, we never give up our gun. That officer went like this. to give up the gun. So we went around that officer. So now as I'm making my way inside, when you walk inside, it's just like a lobby. There's a backwards C at the back wall. That's where you pay. There's two doors. This door is a hallway leads to a bar and a bathroom. This one's an S hallway. It leads to, when you come in, a dance floor, a bar, and then VIP. So as we're coming in, uh, bad guy or suspect starts shooting. He's on the left side. Starts shooting. I'm thinking, holy shit. Those are for us. Pop, 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 pop. So it was like hitting concrete behind us. Like when you get sand in your shoe, yeah, concrete's yeah. going down. Well, luckily, there's two officers that were kudos to them. They actually came, broke this big mirror that Pulse had, broke that mirror, and they came inside and, and then turned and returned fire towards him. I'm sorry, let me say his name, Omar Mateen, because that helps me every time I say it. So they returned fire towards Omar Mateen. So now I go through the S hallway and I remember looking up and I just see straight carnage. And a lot of people don't understand, but from Florida, do you know what a fiddler crab is? No. So those little itty bitty crabs that take over the beach if you stand still. 
Okay. These little, well, the male crabs will do will raise their claw. And that's the first thing I thought when I see these people raising their arms for help. So one of the lieutenants is in, he yells, hey, triage. Who? I'd often refer to the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck, right? With Kate Beckinsale. Have you ever seen the movie? Mm-mm. In one part of the movie, she's triaging patients and she takes the tube of lipstick that she has and she writes an F on one guy's head saying fatal. Like, can't help him. Let's move on. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. Who do you grab? So I grab this, 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 uh, I grab one guy and I start pulling him out. And uh, this other guy grabs my ankle. And I say, don't move. I'll be right back. So I run out. I come back in. That guy that grabbed my ankle is now deceased. Oh, shit. Exactly. I said, fuck. But yeah, your reaction. Yeah. So then I go and I grab a, a lady and I start pulling her out. And this guy had like army low crawled towards me. And he reached up and he grabbed the, my back right pant leg and said, you know, help. I don't want to say stay right there. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. So I was like, sit tight. So I come back out. I go back in. He crawled a little bit away. I go to grab him. I turn him over. Now he's dead. So we got to keep working. So keep working. Finally, I come in and uh, there's this one guy in particular. I start pulling him out. I get him towards the lobby. Now the whole thing, lift with your legs. My my back was hurting. So I put him down, right? And I often think how selfish that was. And he says to me, please, please don't leave me in here. Three times. And it's crazy what my mind thinks. I'm thinking, damn, dude, you don't see my back is hurting? Give me a second. Right? Like, damn. I don't say that to him. I say, I'm not going to fucking leave you. So I pick him back up. I pull him out. And when I pull him out, I go to my left. There's a Dunkin' Donuts right there. One of our tacked unmarked pickup trucks comes up. They pulled the bed down. I put him down and I said, I told you, I told you, motherfucker, I'd get you out. I was celebrating. Right. When I give my presentations, you can tell that there's some people who are offended by that. Like maybe I was being rude to him or something. But no, I was celebrating. I got him out. So a deputy comes over, grabs his legs. I scoop him up. When I scoop him up, he hits the bottom of my chin. And when he hits the bottom of my chin, I hear oof. And I put him on the bed of the truck. And I realized he was deceased. Dennis, no way. Not losing this one. All my army medical training, all OP, all my police medical training, all medical training. I start trying to triage him every way I can. This deputy was Johnny on the spot. He says, bro, stop. Get off me. Bro, stop. Get off me. He goes, you're going to hate me. Shoves me. He's fucking dead. Wow. I wanted to murder that deputy. I was so angry at the deputy, right? So I go back inside uh, against the VIP wall. I see this beautiful girl. She was like kneeling. I think, why didn't you get out? Well, I go to grab her and I grab her and she slips. So now she's looking at me. I'm looking at her. But I remember watching blood this roll go down my arm. It seemed like time was so slow. Finally, I look at her and I realize she didn't run. She got shot in the back left of her neck and her whole right of her face was completely gone. Oh her eyes God. her eyes were there. And I'll tell you, Dennis, that was the most horrific, scary thing I've ever seen in my life. And I'm on the verge of breaking. As I put her down, I hear on the radio that they're saying that Omar Mateen has a, or I'm sorry, that the dog hit, our canine dog hit on his car for explosives. I remember thinking, shit, that sucks. Then I go over to another group. We start calling people out of the office. And I remember hearing he has a suicide vest. He's about to detonate it. You know, the narrative of Pulse is the first 30 officers that went on scene got named in a lawsuit for failure to act and failure to render care. That's horrible. The narrative should be when that happened, me along with every other officer in the club that night knew we were about to die. And you know what, Dennis? Not one of them ran out. Not one. 
knowing this guy's doing a mass casualty, knowing that the canine hit on the car, like it's not a maybe, if so, no, it's a yes. And now he's saying this, right? He's come through through everything else he said. So for me, there was uh, two guys that I grew up with, right? One of them, they were both one grade ahead of me. They went to the Marine Corps after high school. I went to the Army. One of them gets out early. He becomes a cop for the agency I work for. I get out of the Army. I become a cop for the same agency. Our other buddy, he got out. He went to work for another agency. Now he comes to work for our agency. That's the first night we're all together. And I'll tell you, when I saw them in the club that night, in that moment, if you're in the suicide vest, I was like, well, at least I'm dying with them. These guys that have known me my whole life. Then in that moment, though, I will tell you, I used to be afraid to talk about it. I broke. I was two months and one day for marrying my beautiful wife. And I put my hands over my face. And I start screaming, it's not fair. Not that it's not fair I'm going to die. I don't, I don't want to die, but it's not fair that I would never see her again. And I broke. Right, Just the thought of never seeing her again is what really terrified me. So then, uh, you know, once when SWAT gets on scene, they do the thing they call all the patrol officers out of the club. So we go over to the fire department. They're cleaning us off, like biohazard stuff. And then we're pretty much corralled into a parking lot. And we sit there for about four or five hours. Let me just ask you a question. What happened to this dude at this time? So he's in the back of the bathroom. And that's the whole thing about the response was there was people in the bathroom and we were trying to negotiate with him. I believe it was about approximately three hours from when he first started the shooting until he was deceased. So what happened was the command on scene realized we have to do something. So for those that don't know what it was, is there was an air conditioning window on the back of the club where that bathroom was. So they were able to punch that air conditioning out and start getting victims out that way. Then they picked several SWAT officers, kind of like when you see in the movies, I'm going to put you in harm's way. If you don't want to do it, step forward kind of thing. So they picked these guys. What they did is they went to the wall and they had a good idea where he was at. So they blew the wall out from the outside. When they blew that wall out, he Omar had no idea because Omar Mateen, it shows you, had no, no firearm experience. He never shoulder fired. He always hit fired. He, his AR-15 actually jammed, and he's Googling how to clear an AR-15 malfunction as, boom, the wall blows. So he picks up his, his handgun and starts shooting with that. So one of the guys who was on that team that did, was there at the explosion, a good friend of mine and a mentor of mine, told me the story that they blow the wall. They cannot see Omar, but they can see the muzzle flash. Like, I don't know if you know, one of our SWAT officers was shot in the head. Okay, so as they're exchanging fire, one of the SWAT, op SWAT operators gets shot in the head in the helmet. So they immediately take him out. Thank God it was that uh, handgun round and not an AR-15 round. That helmet we have in a display case in the lobby of OPD. Like, damn, man, that helmet saved him. If it would have been a few, few centimeters lower, we would have lost an officer. So they exchange gunfire, blah, blah, blah. Once Smoke is still clearing, but there's no more muzzle flash coming from inside. They realize, okay, they go up to the wall and they see him. He's got a device around his waist. Wow. They don't know if it's, they don't know if it's real or not. After speaking to these SWAT operators, they said that his hand, um, Omar Martin's hand moves. They don't know if he was not dead or if it's like an inadvertent flinch. So what these guys do is they make themselves over his body. They don't lay on him, but they make it like, oh, just in case it's real, they would take the blast and not their brothers. Wow. Why don't we know that? You know? And then there is a rumor, but I will tell you it's almost confirmed that there was Omar Routine was obviously deceased, and then uh, there was a double tap. I can't confirm it. It's rumor, but, you know, take it as you wish. So finally, um, we're going to get released. We're getting briefed. Uh, my phone is in my patrol car. And I ask, can I go to my patrol car? No, it's a crime scene. The FBI has the scene. I ask, can I get my phone? Nope, can't go in the crime scene. 
Okay. Are you, do you know a lot about Black Hawk Down? I mean, I've seen the movie. Do I know a lot about it? No. So the Mogadishu Mile is infamous because horrible planning leads to horrible execution. When they were getting those soldiers out of Black Hawk Down, they didn't bring enough Humvees. So what it was is the soldiers that could still fight and run said, hey, we will run alongside the Humvees. Let's get out of here. Well, the Humvees took off and these guys were left with no cover and they ran a mile through the gauntlet to get safe. Obviously, we didn't do that, but I use that as an analogy because a group of officers and I had to walk down several blocks to the McDonald's to ask to use their phone. So for my wife, she wakes up, a million text messages, a million phone calls. What does she do? She starts calling me. She can't get a hold of me. What does she think? Horrible. <clears throat> so when I finally call her, hearing her voice, something I'll never forget. One of the guys on my squad, he uh, was off that night. He lives in my neighborhood. He said he'll come pick us up. One of the officers that was with me, he did not want to go. He was a single officer, a single apartment. He did not want to go home by himself. So I was like, yeah, ride with us. So there's three of us in this van. We're driving back to where we live. And the guy that was off that night, he gets a phone call because he's on our hazmat team. Hey, hazmat's being activated. We're going to do evidence collection. So he hangs up the phone. I'll never forget. He said, it's a federal crime scene. Why would ha our hazmat do evidence collection? Right? So he drops me off at the house. The other officer wanted to stay at my other buddy's house. So my buddy who was on hazmat realized when he got on scene, there was an evidence collection. They were the body collectors. His story is one in itself. For me, my wife opens the garage door, the big, the big door, and then I walk in the garage. She opens the door into the house. She's standing there. My two dogs are there. It's kind of quiet. I go to take off my uniform. At the bottom of my pant leg was lipped into my boot. When I pull it out, there's... I call it meat on, you know, it was something, right? Some gory thing. Um, I give my wife a lot of credit. She didn't ask any questions. I gave me a hug, gave me a kiss. It wasn't until Dennis, I got up and I took a shower. and she, I knew she was downstairs. And me being alone in that shower was the adrenaline dump. And it all came out. I started crying. I bet. And everything. So I had to post a message on Facebook to let everyone know that I'm okay. My phone's in the car. I try to take and get a little sleep that I could, but I couldn't. Um, I wake up and I remember just sitting up, sitting with my wife on the couch. And just people were calling her. And so she was dealing with that. And she, I just sat with her. Now, what I learned from that is let's focus on the event. But let's focus on after the event, because after the event, I still had to go back to work that night. It made you go back to work the next night. Yeah. So I'm sleeping ish. I wake up. It's around two o'clock, three o'clock. And I have to be back at work at six. Can I just say something? You know, it's crazy, dude. There was uh, another significant casualty event that occurred. And I know somebody that was involved. They were the second or third person into this. It's a very well-known one. And they were sent back to work that night. And the person was literally calling me saying like, how, you know, like, it is they we didn't want to pay overtime to other people to come in and work the road. So they 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 literally and the people on like on vacation days, they made these people who responded to this all go back to work the next night. Well, I think it was I think it was it was just you know piss poor planning. They they didn't have a plan, right? Try to keep anything status quo. So there I get the shift. Uh yes, it's the federal crime scene, the FBI. Fucking has crazy, it. dude. But we we as the local agency are doing a court on around it. I got dispatched to a court owned spot. The court owned spot I had, I could see the patio. And it's, you know, it's Florida, it's summer, it rains. And I could see a victim laying on their back getting rained on. Still the next day. Now I know they have to take the photos and that takes a while and everything, but, you know, maybe not, maybe it was a different officer, it'd be different. But for me, huh, I couldn't take my sergeant came over and kudos to him. He knew, hey, get him off of this. And then I expressed, I told him about myself and he goes, Hey, let's get him his cell phone. So I was able to get it. Jesus Christ. Then the next day, you know, it's funny. My buddy that had to do the, to take the bodies out, him and I go to our neighborhood pool. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning. We're drinking some Corona's 
of course, the old ladies of the pool come over and make a complaint that we're drinking glass bottles at the pool. You know, it's just like, lady, if you would have known what we've just been through the past 48 hours, give us a break, you know? So uh, that was, yeah, that was it. And then, you know, talk about responses afterwards. Uh, I'm very vocal about this. Every single officer, crime scene tech, dispatcher, anyone involved, including other agencies, had to go to the local high school that Wednesday. And we got separated into classrooms, about 20 to 25 people. Like I said, you have everyone, dispatchers, other agencies, this and that, all in there. And we have a thing down here called SISM, Crisis Intervention Stress Management. So after something like this, you meet with the SISM officer. Immediately, I knew that the problem was one SISM officer for 20 to 25 people. You are not gonna remember my story. There we are, they start going around. I remember this dispatch. I remember another officer from another agency saying, oh, I had a four own spot. I got to see SWAT, like so ignorant to the fact. We had a dispatcher. She was a dis one of the dispatchers who actually talked to Omar Mateen. And she was talking about how she can't sleep by herself. And I remember thinking like, you bitch, you weren't going to die that night. Now, that was me being ignorant at the time and not understanding PTSD. Right. So I, I do. She's a good friend of mine now. Um, I do regret that that happened, or I thought that. As we go around to the officers actually involved that were inside, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. Nothing to say. Okay, time to go. You guys are released. That was in June. We had a six-month training thing where every officer that responded had to go and meet with a local college who's trying to make PTSD a big thing. And just, you know, we're here for you. Here's our phone number. That's it. That's it. I did not know that how bad cha it changed me. Like I said, two months and one day after the shooting, I married my wife. And what was cool was no one knew I was going to do it. We got married up in Ohio where she's from. So all my friends had to travel up there. And, you know, the best man or the maid of honor gets her speech. The best man, my twin brother, gives his speech. And only the DJ knew. He handed me her microphone. And I walked out in the middle of the dance where everyone's around me. No one knew I was going to do it. It's like, what? What is Rick doing talking? And I said, yeah, guys, I'm pretty much, I'm here today. Uh, thank you all for coming, blah, blah, blah. But obviously, you guys know the tragic event that happened two months ago. I'm here today because my now wife was there for me every step of the way. All the nightmares that I had, she would just, like, that was one good thing about my wife is all the nightmares I had, she would just scratch my back. Never asked me about the nightmares, right? And then I also said, and also I want to say that, uh, you know what, how about this? And I said, each guy that was with me that night, I said their name and told them to stand up. So now you all have all these people popping up. And I say, this is more important because that night when everyone ran it, everyone was running out, these are the guys that ran in with me and that were willing to die with me and give their lives to save others. And I'm here today and they're here today. We're all here today. And I get to marry my wife because of them. Still gives me goosebumps and they got the biggest standing ovation. But I thought that was my way of saying thank you to them. You know, like, you know, it's guys say, thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. But no, that was my way of saying thank you. And it was a very emotional and raw moment. So, you know, that was my thing for them. So, um, afterwards, though, I didn't realize how much I changed. Uh, I used to traffic stops, pursuits, all that. And my squad actually went to my sergeant, said, hey, I don't think things right. Went to my lieutenant. So the sergeant lieutenant called me in, expressed their concerns. What? How do you think I was? I was pissed. You motherfuckers. Like, what the hell? Did a mute on me? And uh, to this, like, even to this day, I still, I'm still fr close with all of them. You know, they know that they did the right thing. But I didn't address Pulse again until 2000 really 2021 when I started going to therapy because I talk about Christina Grimmie died that night or the night before then it was pulse 2017 I lost my best friend to an officer involved shooting 2018 my dad died of an opioid overdose 2020 we lost a baby in 2021 my best friend from the army committed suicide so I always say I didn't know that people ask me do I regret pulse absolutely not but I paid a heavy price. 
And so in saying all that, I started going to therapy. I started speaking out, started doing these programs, but I realized what's the way that I can show people that you can come forward. You can have the courage, right? I work with the One Pulse Foundation and actually Dennis in February, they let actually let me go back inside Pulse. Fuck. They, the, the owner turn, asked me, I said, turn on the lights, turn on everything. And I think walking, because I wouldn't even drive by it. So I think walking back inside there, obviously going to therapy, being open about it, obviously helped me. I turned to my mentor and I actually start laughing. And I say, this is it. Like, this is the place that has haunted me for so long. You know, and in that moment it almost became like a memorial instead of like, you know, the devil's playground, if you will. So Pulse still open. It's not. It's uh the owner of Pulse. Um, she was getting paid by the One Pulse Foundation, the nonprofit, X amount of dollars every month. So the whole thing was the One Pulse Foundation bought all the property surrounding Pulse. They're gonna build a huge Pulse Memorial. But once when the One Pulse Foundation started saying to the owner, hey, we're gonna withdraw your monthly thing, she's like, I'm no longer gonna donate the property. So that's the that's the uh, tiff right now going on. So if you drive by it, um, they have a memorial wall around it, but there's a pane glass window where you can see the front. But yeah, it's uh, still the same now. So, but if I can say one more quick thing, the cool thing was, uh, you know, this past Monday made seven years, and every year I would be really messed up. You know, it would be a bad day. Um, but two thousand. 22, I went to therapy for PTSD rehab. And when I got back a few weeks later, it was that Pulse anniversary. And then that rehab changed my life because it taught me about forgiveness and it taught me to say Omar Mateen. And I'll never forget, uh, like I said, it was a few weeks after rehab. Um, it was a Sunday fun day. A lot of people out drinking. Now, my Sunday fun day is running errands with my wife and kids, getting my son a toy. And everyone's calling and texting me, and I, it's okay, but uh, I'm OCD. I have to take an afternoon shower. When I got home, started taking the shower, started listening to music. A song came on that kind of reminded me of it, and I still hadn't said his name yet. And all of a sudden, my wife's in the bathroom, and I said, God damn it, Bethany. She's like, what? And I was like, Omar fucking Mateen. I started crying, started laughing, started getting mad. It was all those emotions for six years, and I'll never forget this. to tell me how far i've come my four-year-old comes in daddy why are you crying i don't know buddy i'm just so happy he starts jumping up and down saying i'm happy too hey guys follow us on all social media platforms to include instagram twitter facebook facebook group we have so much information going on every single day and we don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff so check it out go give us a follow so what was good is now this year last monday mid seven years my squad was working that sunday beforehand um we decided where we're going to go to breakfast. They decided Einstein's bagels, which we never go there. I didn't realize it was across the street from Pulse. Obviously, the anniversary was the next day. We we're off to the anniversary. And uh, so we're sitting there eating. I say, hey, guys, do you think uh, afterwards we can you know, go across? They said, why do you think we're here? Oh, shit. That was cool. So afterwards, we went across the street. Now, obviously, we're outside, but it's like you could have heard a pin drop. They were all listening. I think seeing the building and seeing the bullet holes and seeing this, they realized how to, this was, think went through this. That meant a lot to me. I mean, God dang, that meant a lot. The next day, obviously, was the anniversary. I was off that day. My wife went into the office. A lot of people were calling and texting me. I appreciate it. Um, I ignored them all. Not because I was in a bad mood. I was going to turn to alcohol or cry. No, I just wanted the day to chill by myself. And I just look at, yeah, man, I've come a long way, you know? So the one good thing about going back inside the Pulse is if an officer wants to come inside, I have a good connection with the owner. They just have to come to me. I vet them, and then the owner will allow them to go inside. So I think that's a great opportunity for those who are struggling. I um, have a question. Sure. And the question is? What made you decide to go to therapy? Good question. You know, with everything I said that all the tragic loss I had, um, 
for those that don't know, like when I was a young kid, my dad started doing the opiates like we talked about before. It got to a point where my mom would kick me out and I would sleep in the shed at my high school from 16 to 18. What that did to me then, I had no idea, but obviously I know now abandonment issues and whatnot. So what made me go to therapy? Uh, it was 2021. I was going through a lot. And in the army, there was a group of 10 of us, but you know how you have closer groups inside that 10. Well, the, my best friend, uh, he uh, got blown up downrange. When he goes back to Germany, his wife isn't coming to visit him every day at the hospital. He thinks that's weird. Well, you know, because of the getting blown up, he got home too early. His wife was cheating on him. There was another guy living in the house. Wow. So my buddy went through all that. He had a problem with alcohol. The army was great to him. People say a lot of bad things about the army. The army is great. He went to rehab three times. February of 21, he tried to hang himself. So in that group of 10, they didn't know only me. Obviously, the guy that tried to hang himself and this other one of our other buddies, name, his last name's Cook. I won't say his first name, but so um yeah, it was June 7th of 2021. I'm running and gunning. And uh, let me back up. 2019, I was hurt on the job. I was on light duty. And I thought, God, why am I so angry? This, that. Worst thing that happened to me was I got healed, run and gun, right? Never thought about it again. So here I'm in 2021. And my buddy he called me one night. I ignored the call because I was in training. I, he texted me some stuff. And I said, oh, I'm training you good. And he goes, call me later, bro. I love you. I leave training that night. I go to call him. Ah, call him later. The next day, I'm laying in bed. I get up to go to the bathroom. I hear my phone ring. Now, all those guys, they never call me my first name. They never leave me voicemails. I get back. I look at my phone. I see Cook left me a voicemail. 16 years of knowing him. I knew something was off. I listen to the voicemail. All it said was, Rick, my first name. Dennis, I knew. And the sad thing was, my buddy, like, if you go enlisted route in the military, if you get E7, you made it. He got E7, and he made it. He got an awesome job at the Pentagon. My buddy Cook was going out there to spend the last few days with him at Missouri. And uh, I call him, I call Cook, and he says we lost him. Instantly, I thought, wow, he's a, and I said it on the phone, he's a lucky motherfucker. And my buddy on the, what? And I felt like, God, did I just say that? I felt like the darkness, if you want to use like image, had tied me to a post and was speaking for me. Almost like, you know, the Terminator. I felt like that. I couldn't believe I said it. So then two weeks later, my beautiful fatty patty daughter's born. I felt nothing for her. And uh, I didn't even realize in 2020, because I always wanted a girl. Like, I'm a big emotional guy, a little princess. 2020, God took a baby from us. And here, 2021, he's given me what I wanted, a beautiful baby girl. Felt nothing. I knew I was fucked up. And uh, there was a local college who got millions and millions of dollars in federal funding to be the number one PTSD college in the nation. I reach out to them. That was the first time I didn't even tell my wife. I didn't even tell my best friends that about sleeping in the shed. And they told me four sessions in on a zoom call. I am too damaged for what they can provide. They got millions and millions of dollars in federal funding and I'm too damaged. They gave me a list to call people. I was done, Dennis. I thought, man, I have a beautiful baby girl. It makes me feel nothing. I try to go to therapy. They don't want to help. I'm done. I did not care anymore. Life did not matter to me at all. Uh, luckily, I went to work. I was having those horrible thoughts, and I made a decision to go to work one day. And uh, he called, my lieutenant. that lieutenant almost reminds me of you, right? Very brash, very open, very blunt. And I'm sitting there, and... Uh, in the briefing room, he comes in the briefing room and he says, hey, Fink, come in my office. Dennis, I'm so far gone. I didn't even look up from my phone. I said, ha, do I need a rep? Like, you know, like a union rep. Being the most disrespectful. My buddy's punching me in my leg. And it shows you how good of a leader he is because others were, you know, 
jumped down my throat then. He stays calm. He says, hey, Pink, come to my office. So I sigh. I get in his office, and Dennis, he does this. Sit the fuck down. Who the fuck do you think you are? Right? Chewing me out because I just disrespect him, right? Fair. He says, look, man, we're trying to start attack, like street crimes again. This sergeant's going to be the sergeant. This corporal, you must be best friends with him because he wants you. I'll show you an email I got from your former lieutenant who says, yeah, Fink needs to be on this squad. Everything you've been through, good and bad, we feel like you'd be great to teach these younger officers. I hear Fink, all these good accolades, this, 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 this. It's not the Fink I see. The Fink I see never comes to work. The Fink I see has no stats. The Fink I see is miserable to be around. What is wrong with you? That pissed me off, Dennis. Finally, how good of a leader he is, he says, are you okay? Finally, six years of absolute hell. My nightmare of a childhood. Someone says, are you okay? I said no. And I broke down in that moment. So, like I said, my dad was the commander of the SWAT team. His nickname was Zeus. So all these older guys, the ones that are chiefs and had dead before retired, I've known them my whole life. One of them that retired, turned out he was working in the mental health field. My lieutenant says, reach out to him. Do you know him? Of course, I know him. I reach out to him, and he's like, hey, brother, I want you to do therapy. I'm going to put you in touch with the therapist, blah, blah, blah. Now, when we used to get in trouble when we were younger, my dad used to say, Ricky. And so I'm talking to this guy on the phone. I said, oh, I'm not doing the therapy again. Fuck that. And I'll never forget. He said, Ricky. Oh. That snapped me back to, oh, yes, sir, you know, just like my dad did. And uh, he's like, you're doing this. And finally, the therapist calls me one day and she says, hi, my name's so-and-so. I'm looking for, you know, it says my name. I'm like, that's him. She goes, sweetie, you have five minutes to tell me your life story and go. I'm like, excuse me? She's like, honey, I've already started the timer. Go. So I start talking. Whoa, 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 whoa. five minutes. Hung up. She hung up the phone. So it turns out she's a big PTSD mental health guru for the military. She did, she's done a lot of research in uh, head injuries, adrenaline, this and that, right? The drug I was using that kept me going for so long was adrenaline, right? And she realized, like, if to portray it to you, most therapies do this. Okay, Dennis, come on, Dennis. It's okay. You know, like that Debbie Darling shit, right? Not her. She believes us. We don't need that. We see shit, the horrible shit every day. We believe, let's fucking go, Dennis. And a good example is the day of my dad's death anniversary. It's terrible for me. I'm always in like a dark, dark cloud over my head. We had therapy dues two days before. We said, we're gonna, I'm going to do this, this, this. Yeah, okay, yeah, on the Zoom call. Yes, 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 yes. Two days later, I'm not doing that. Show you how powerful she is. She calls me. Listen, Fink, I don't have time for you today. I know you're not doing what the fuck I told you. Like a therapist using the F word. Well, I want to tell you something. Your dad is dead. He'll be dead tomorrow. He'll be dead next year. I'm sorry, he'll be dead next week. He'll be dead next year. Get up and live your life. Hung up the phone. She had me hooked since then. I realized. Now, I was still running and gunning at the time. I was lying to her and everybody saying, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Then we came. We were looking for a car one night and uh, we were helping. We ended up helping patrol trying to find this missing juvenile. This missing juvenile drowned in, the, in a pond. So I saw that and it messed me up. And then the end of 2021, beginning of 22 was my complete breakdown. I felt like the darkness had control of me. I told my wife the marriage is over. Everything. My therapist says, think, go to day shift. My sergeant, go to day shift. Why? Because I don't have to run and gun anymore, right? I get to go home every night to my wife and kids. I was terrified. I had a partner for five years in my car. I don't want to sit alone in my car with that darkness. And so she said, Frank, look, you know who's cheering you on. You got to go up and swing the bat. If you miss, it's fucking okay. We're here for you. I went. So then I watched, she sent me a video of Andrew Luck, the football player, and there's a video, why are you retiring so early? And he says something effective. I've had a passion for football for this game my whole life. And I always will. But I realize this is just a game. It's not my life. Will I retire today? For 10 more years, my life goes on. And that hit me. So I go to day shift. Wow. 
I went from a bailout a month ago chasing some guy. Obviously, he was going to lose a foot pursuit. He turns around and pulls a gun, maybe three feet from me, fighting from that gun. Today shift for an air. I take a picture of the call. Area check for a wild chicken trying to bite people. <laughs> Stress went way down. And you know what? I got to go home every night to my wife and kids. And I realized, man, this is how life could be. And then here I am almost a year and a half later. When you're back in your lieutenant's office and after he yells at you and then asks you if you're okay, and you start breaking down there, obviously an emotional moment. How did he react? What was his reaction? The right way. He told me some of his stuff he was going through. That was that connection. Like he was at Pulse. And I, I see it now. Like you have to be able to give a little, to take a little, to build that connection. If he would have sat there stoic, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today. But, you know, him telling me a little bit of his stuff really made me, oh, I'm not the only one. That's what we always think is I'm the only one. My story is just, but my story is not more important than his, but it's relatable. So he did the right thing. Maybe you can be a little more descriptive. Like he started sharing things with you, but did you, did he extend like a hug to you? Like, tell me about. So we're sitting across the desk and uh, he'll hate me for saying this, but. He didn't have tears come down, but his eyes, his eyes filled. But uh, yeah, at the end, he stands up and goes to give me a hug over the desk and then walks around and gave me the biggest hug. And it was that hug where it's that extra squeeze. But to continue what he did, was checking on me. Then I went to day shift and we had a thing. Him, this my sergeant and myself would text each other every month that I was on day shift. Just to make sure. And then as I got better, it extends to every four months, right? Because we, we didn't need it every month. Now I know if I call him, pick up the phone, he'll answer. Same with my sergeant. Every time I talk about my presentation or do this, I say, those two guys are the ones that saved my life. But the saying, save my life, is overused. So it, it's devalued so much. But these two save my life. Not to go back too far, but I know that you talked about a lot of the people you were trying to save and you couldn't. Did you ever find out who those people were? Do you know who they are? I do. How'd you, how'd you discover that? Well, photos, obviously, from like on the news and whatnot. But um, the two in particular that I never, I never talked, I never, I never talked about the security guard. Turns out she was the second one that he shot. Jesus Christ. So I blame myself for years. Damn, if I didn't say, give me one second. Damn it. So that one, I never told anybody until this past year when I was about to go on Pulse. I knew I had to tell my entire story. Otherwise, going in there would mean nothing. I couldn't hold anything back. But the one guy that, you know, hit my chin, I, I've never told anybody who he is. I mean, that's just my my thing with him, you know. But yeah, have I know him. Have you ever spent time with the families of the victims? So... If I go back to your previous question real quick. So when I started talking about the security guard, there was a, a lieutenant for the fire department, like our sister fire department. He realized we're buddies. He realized what he's an arson. So he helped works with us. He realized what I was doing. You know, he came to me for some help. We're talking about Pulse one day. He was the one that when she was brought out, started working on her. What a small world, you know? So I think that's, that's that connection him and I have. So the one guy that died, that hit my chin, um, one of the officers that are uh, higher up at the department, he had a connection with the FBI. So I had reached out to the family first year afterwards, and uh, they were not, they did not want to meet me. Same thing the next year, the next year, never wanted to meet me. So when I went to rehab, uh, we were talking about that in group therapy. And though another officer, she was, from another agency said, because it was the time where we can speak freely to each other. And we had worked on it to where we're not going to upset with it. She said, hey, Fink, um, you keep saying about that family every year and it puts you more in a downward spiral. Do you think maybe this year you don't do it? I'm like, are you out of your mind? And the therapist was like, no, go with it, go with it. And she goes, I don't know, you know, you, you often think like, man, they don't want to see me, but maybe that's being selfish. Maybe give them time. Mm -hmm. So here we come after rehab. The the officer or the I'm not gonna say his rank, but the officer that has the connection 
He reaches out and says, Fink, yes or no? I said, no, not this year. And I'll, for his first year, really? I said, yeah, not this year. And he goes, I respect that. So hopefully one day, you know. But uh, the one thing I had to learn, which was hard, my therapist says, when you're in those environments, you know, you all, like someone asked you, look at a picture. Remember the five things from the picture. We always forget the little things. Remember the little things. What did he say to me? Please, please don't leave me in. If you want to look at it, I didn't leave him in there. He got out. He did not die inside there. He got out. I take that with me. You know, I, I used to always say Rick Fink ran inside the club that night. And that Rick Fink never ran back out. That's true. Part of it. The part of it that ran back out is this new one that wants to show others. It's okay. You walk through the fires of hell and you come out burnt, but you're still there. So, you know, those are the things. But for years, I did not see that. For years, I blamed myself because I thought, oh, he saw the two patrol cars. He waited till the patrol car drove away. You know. But yes, I always carry them with me. Yeah. How's Rick Fink doing? Do people do that shit to you all the time? Yeah. I, 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 no one ever calls me Rick. I mean, it's I've been called Fink since high school. Like it's a, uh, yeah. So I hear Rick, I'm like, whoa. Or when I'm at it, ordering something, hey, what's your name? Rick? No, I feel awkward. I always say Fink. But uh, how's Rick how's, Fink today? How's Rick, how's Rick Fink doing today? Phenomenal. And the best example I can give you for my buddy's death anniversary, uh, the first year, a year ago, I was in a really dark place. And his anniversary was a couple weeks ago. I was able to get up moved the curtains away, went up, and I did a presentation to one of the local sheriff's agencies about PTSD. That's how far I've come. You know, like, like if uh, you ask my wife, I think what's often forgot about is the family. Like my wife, if I look and see, damn, who's been there with me? Who's ride or died? Not a lot of people. But my wife has, she went through the gauntlet because all the nightmares, the demons, the horror, horrors, and the hell, who do I take it out on? My wife, I regret that. And you ask me how I'm doing? Well, I felt nothing when my daughter was born. Tomorrow's her two year, she'll be two years old. She's my little light. You know, I'll always regret not feeling anything for her. And, you know, live life with no regrets. Ah, no, live with them because you've learned from it. And for her, I'll always regret that. But it, it keeps me going. You know, but yeah, how's Rick Fink doing? Wow. The new and improved, I guess you can say. I'm on I'm on here able to say, oh, Omar Mateen. At, at first, as you saw, I wasn't able to do it. Fuck that. You know. Life is not easy. Just isn't. But it's worth it. And you know, dude, I'm not trying to compare myself to what you've been through, but you know, I've I've been through some stuff, especially lately. And um, yeah, it's, it's tough, but it's, it's worth it. I don't know what else. No, I agree it's, wor- it's worth getting through it because the other side of it, the other things that are great in life are just so priceless, so beautiful, and sometimes just so simple. Yeah. My my daughter's saying dada. But you know how worth how much it's worth it, I will tell you that when I got back from rehab, the officer that first reached out to me for help, I barely knew him. Here we are all the all this time later, just over a year later, I just did a presentation on Friday, told my story. He was in my class or the, in the class. 
This is a guy that first reached out to me, which then started others, others, others. So he's the one, the first one. He's in the class. And uh, as I get to the part where him, obviously I don't say his name or his story. I just talk about, you know, I'm reaching out. He gives me a wink and a nod. In the class, I always go and I shake everyone's hand. And uh, when I get to him, he actually gives me a hug and says, bro, I'm here because of you. What's the blessing in disguise? The blessing in disguise is it's okay. I'm fine. Oh, are you good? Yeah, you're good. The blessing in disguise is talk about it. Come out and say about it, right? We we put a, we put the stick, we put getting help, everything as a disguise, right? We know it's there, but we don't really want to reveal it. But once you reveal it, that's the blessing. I'm sure you see it all the time. You told me last time that these officers have Christmas because of reaching out to you or talking to you. And the thing I always use is, you know, 22 a day. The the We have 22 a day. You see it all over Facebook and social media and this and that. Why do we still have 22? The blessing in disguise is lowering that number. The blessing in disguise is having you allow me to be on here to share my story. Now, I can't thank you enough for that. I think the blessing in disguise is if this didn't happen to Rick Fink, Rick Fink couldn't fulfill his life's purpose to help others. So as fucking weird as this sounds, you were the chosen one. It had to happen to you because I God needed you to do his work. I appreciate you saying that because my whole life I thought I was a runner and a gunner. And it took all this time to realize maybe that was not what I was meant to do. What I was meant to do is what you're saying. And it's I pretty apparent. It's pretty clear, Rick. Thank it's you. So pretty much. clear. I, that unfortunately a tragedy had to happen to prevent a lot more tragedies from happening. It's funny how the world works. I'm just watching your podcast when I'm watching mics and I just I can see the hurt in them. We click on Instagram, you know, just how the world works. It's crazy. You know, and I think you know, I lost some friends. I lost good friends coming out here and trying to break the stigma. You know, I, 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 you know, I think about, you know, shell shock back in the 1900s with World War One. That was that was PTSD. Oh no, shell shock. Right. You look at World War Two. You look at the divorce rate. You look at the alcoholics. You look at my dad. You ask me why my dad died. He didn't die of opiate overdose. He died of the stigma. It's too afraid to come get help. Zeus couldn't come off that mountain. And so, which no one likes change. For hundred about 100 years, law enforcement has been, we don't talk about it. But don't ask, don't tell. We came out about that, right? Let's come out about what you're doing and what I'm doing, breaking that stigma. It's going to be hard because we're fighting a monster, a monopoly that has not changed for 100 years. And no, I can tell you, no department wants to be that first department that really opens it up. But you're going to have to. You know, at, at what price of an officer? No, that's what they'll wait for. They'll wait till that happens. Yeah, it's too late then. It's always you know? too late, dude. We try to forecast it and give advice to prevent it, but I mean, just for, they, they don't want to listen. Sake, we advertise twenty two a day. Does anyone go? And you know, I heard an interesting stat. You know, challenge coins. There's a company that makes law enforcement challenge coins. And then every year at the end of the day, they make the challenge coin for all the officers who died in line of duty on that challenge coin. If they had to do suicide, there would be five challenge coins. Wow. What advice do you have for anybody who's going through some shit and they're on the fence about getting help? Fuck it. Come forward. How valuable is your life? Before this podcast, I was just talking to an officer. Right. I said, I have connections to therapy. I don't know. Why? That's kind of weird. No, it's not. That's that stigma. And, you know, self-worth would be my advice. And self-worth is not how valuable valuable you are to yourself. It's how valuable you are to everyone else, to your wife, to your kids. My best friend committed suicide because he didn't think he was worth it. No, his, he had a son. God forbid if I did it. My, I had a terrible relationship with my dad when he became addicted. I passed that on to my son. 
my advice would be learn, learn your self-worth. You know, I wear this every day to remind me of my self-worth, to remind me of that stigma. So yeah, my, that would be my advice. Life is worth it. Yeah. And you only get one go around. Like the country song says, you only get one go around, you finish line six feet in the ground. There ain't no coming back. You know, Life's a gift. It's precious. And let me tell you, you know what's a gift? My wife. My wife is a gift. Sounds like you're pretty lucky. I'm extremely lucky. It makes me emotional thinking about it. You're allowed to be emotional. You're making me yeah. emotional fucking listening to you. It's just, I have, uh, you know, I do my presentations and I'm honest. I say, I wasn't the best husband. I would get in her face and yell. I would call her, her horrible names. And it, it was never at her. It was at the fucking hell I was going through. But I was too afraid. So what did I do? Like a bully, I took it out on someone. And uh, my wife, man, she, you know, my dad didn't stick by my side. My best friend left. They were too afraid, you know, but my wife stuck by it. She should have left me a long time ago. And uh, still drives me nuts, you know. But I'm thankful every day for her. You know, and I think about all those years running and gunning, just putting her on the back burner. You know? Why do you think and, she uh, stayed? She loves me. like Unconditional love, huh? I think she knows. Yes, to your question. You know, the guy that she met was gone, but not ever had a pulse. And uh, I think after Pulse, it was an adjustment. I don't know what it's like living with someone with PTSD, as she doesn't know what it's like living with PTSD. And I think that's the problem with relationships is finding that medium, understanding the triggers, understanding this. But at the same time, I always tell people, if you have PTSD, you have to be accountable for your actions. Just because you have PTSD does not give you the right to yell at your wife or your husband. Does not. But it's finding that common ground. And I think my wife... You know, when we first met, she said I had the biggest heart. And I think she knew all these years that my heart was still there. And then when it finally came all in the end of 21, you know, she told me after Pulse, I changed and she got pushed back. And all the trauma that kept happening, right? She didn't know how to work her way back up. Because just like me, she was un- she was unaware of what to do. But you know what? And she makes it known. She fucking stayed. Well, a lot of people want to. A lot of says people a lot about up. who she is, dude. Says a lot about her character. A lot of people would have given up on me. I would have given up on myself, to be honest. So it takes a very strong-willed person to love somebody that much that they still love you, even when you don't love them back. Like you think about it. Uh, when I felt nothing for my daughter. I thought life wasn't worth it. Talk about your self-worth. I didn't even think about her. I didn't even think about my kids. And I know I've hurt her. And like I said, I'll always regret it, but I learned from my regrets. And even to this day, we're still working on that common ground because it's changing every day. You know? You think she's forgiven you? Yeah. I mean, I had to think about it because I wasn't. I think she's forgiven me, but I just think she's afraid of falling back into that, which she has every right to feel that way. Yeah, scary. She's the only human being. Yeah. Man, I love her. I know she's going to watch this, so babe, I love you. It's a uh, beautiful thing to say. And I'm just getting choked up. That's why there's these pauses because uh everyone think, checks everyone checks in on me rick how you doing I, anyone check in on your spouse no because that's also the the disguise i think you're an amazing human being thank you like sure when she met me my pale self rubbing tanning oil on me that day on the beach she never thought she'd have to go through this and I, you know what i've learned is she sees another human being going through this hell that hurts her. She sees the guy that she, she fell in love with 
going through it, and it hurts her. And then she sees the guy that's not the guy she met, and that hurts her. And uh, I thank you for this. I mean, I really do. She, uh, like I said, I know she's going to watch this, and I want to make it known how grateful I am for her. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to be on here, by the way. You don't have to thank me, dude. Like, that's what this whole thing's about. It's what it exists for. You know? So, yeah, I'm excited for tomorrow. My fatty patty turns two years old. And, uh, yeah. And my son's five now, and it's just... Fucking great. Awesome. Absolutely fuck, fucking great. So. Ooh. Well, dude, I think we uh, did a hell of a job together today. Thank you. And the door is open here. <clears throat> and if there's anything I can do to help push your initiative, I'm glad to help you. Thank you. Can I just say one thing about you and street cop. Sure. But I let's not make this about me. Just so we're clear and we'll lighten it up a little bit right now. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say this before I kind of know where you're going to go with things, but I'm just acting the way I think I'm supposed to act and behave. So I understand the work's important. It means a lot to people, but um, just like you're doing the work, people are thankful that you're doing the work. Same thing. Uh, just at the end of my life, I want to be able to say that I did everything I could. And that's not just only as this, but also as a father and a friend. Yeah. And um, I don't want to, like right now I can say I have no regrets and I want to keep it that way. And I pay a great tax <laughs> for it. In every in every facet, I just said to my VP, we were talking before, I said, if I could just get like two weeks, I was just like, the, everything is great. I would just, oh, what I would yeah. do for that. Like, like, give me it's two weeks. Now, by like the way, the like, holy grail, yeah. But guess what? Like, everything is great. You know, yeah. everything I, is great. You, you just got to change your perspective a little bit, right? Like, when I you mean, you asked me that question, who is, how is Rick Fink now? Yeah, I really, yeah, how is Rick Fink now? Yeah. Everything's great. I have some big changes coming up too. And it's just everything. And that's what I want to say about Street Cop is because of what you're doing, I saw the podcast with Mike. Mike and I became friends. Mike, in the five months we know, has pushed me so much farther than I should be at right now. But yeah, it's crazy how the world works. Mike is, uh, He's one of those guys, man, that challenges me and makes my life better. So and it's because of Street Cop, because I was watching it one night in bed. So, you know. I appreciate it, man. You're doing and, good um, things, man. Thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Rock and roll. See you, bro. Hey, guys, check out our upcoming training at streetcop.com. Don't forget, we have 50 instructors nationally teaching a variety of topics. These are the best classes you're going to experience in your career. We make sure of it. You're going to love it. I guarantee you, you're going to be thankful that you went. Check us out at streetcop.com for all upcoming classes in your area.